Hey, what's up, guys? Today, I'll show you a horror thriller film, Creep Show, Part 2. Spoiler ahead, watch out and take care. The movie starts in Maine, where a town boy named Billy on his Tesla bike excitedly waits for the delivery truck at the newsstand. The truck shutters open to reveal the creep as the trucker, who's arranging loads of packages. The creep notices Billy nearby and notes how eager he is to get a quick hand on the latest issue of Creep Show Comics. Therefore, he drops the package on the ground to show a stack of comics. Billy grabs one copy of his, followed by the creep jumping off the truck, levitating in the air, and disappearing in front of Billy. Billy blinks his eyes to grasp what he just saw, but then proceeds to read his comic. The creep teleports to his castle and introduces the first tale called Old Chief Wooden Head. It happens in Dead River in Arizona, a town that once thrived in money and fame, but eventually declined into a bleak ghost town. Most businesses had moved out to the cities except an elderly couple, Ray and Martha, who chose to stay behind to take care of their 30-year-old general store. One of their special and respected ornaments is a cigar store Indian named Old Chief Woodenhead, but Ray simply refers to him as Chief. One afternoon, Martha goes to the porch and finds Ray repainting Chief's war paint on his cheeks. She tries to persuade Ray to close up their store while they still have time. Ray doesn't want to because of the memories and how the store helped their family live throughout the years. Still, Martha indicates they hardly earn because they don't often get too many customers anymore. She also mentions how their life savings have been reducing over time because Ray decides to give charity to people whom she feels doesn't deserve his kindness. Meanwhile, Benjamin, an elder of a Native American tribe, is having his car fixed at a car station. He visits Ray afterward in his store and greets him and Chief on the porch. Ray invites Benjamin inside to accommodate his needs, but to his surprise, he receives a bag. Martha comes out of the back room, and she and Benjamin greet each other. When Ray unfurls the bag, he and Martha go eye-wide at the sight of the turquoise jewelry before them. Benjamin tells them it's a collection of his tribe's precious treasures, and they want the elderly couple to keep them as collateral for the meantime, while they pay their debts within two years. If the tribe fails to pay on time, the elderly couple can keep them all. But Ray refuses to accept the bag because it's too much. Benjamin insists on keeping them because it's an insult and rude to return payment. In the end, Ray reluctantly keeps the bag and swears to guard the treasures with all his might. Benjamin is about to leave when Martha calls out to him and professes how the tribe's initiative and willingness to pay back to them has proven her wrong when it comes to abusing Ray's act of charity. Benjamin acknowledges the candor and shortly exits the store. Ray and Martha follow Benjamin outside, who says goodbye to Chief. Chief unexpectedly nods at him, causing Benjamin to fall into shock. He shortly recovers and departs the store in his car. The elderly couple smile as they watch Benjamin set off home, but this smile turns to a frown when they enter the store. Fear accumulates in the elderly couple when they see Benjamin's delinquent and estranged nephew, Sam, surrounding them inside the store with his two thug friends. The thugs are at the store to empty all the goods and money, which they need to fund their trip to Los Angeles. Sam threatens the elderly couple to follow what they say if they want to live, otherwise shotgun bullets are going to dig into their bodies. While the two thug friends scour food and sellable items on the shelves, Sam orders Martha to retrieve her purse in the back room. While Martha retrieves her purse, Sam enters the photo booth to capture his long dry hair. He then turns to Ray to brag that his hair is his ticket to becoming a movie star. When Martha finally gives the thugs the purse, Sam forces Martha to admire his photo college. Meanwhile, one thug encourages Sam to leave the place, since there's nothing left to steal anymore. However, Sam knows the bag in Ray's hands is precious, so the fatty friend initiates retrieving the bag. Martha tries to stop him, but this costs her life. Sam dispatches Ray next when he slowly approaches the dead Martha. The thugs soon vacate the store to go home and pack their things. While they're so confident about their future, they're unaware of how their crime has awakened their karma. Chief on the porch reanimates into motion, who repaints his cheeks with red paint, followed by a war cry. That night, Chief visits the thugs one by one to pay for their crimes. He first visits the fatty thug in his trailer house to shoot arrows on his chest and head, then corners another thug in their garage to gash him with a tomahawk, and lastly, visits Sam in his home to skin his scalp off clean, using a hunting knife. The next day, Benjamin wakes up but is surprised to see the bag bloodstained on his bed. Therefore, he goes to the store and sees Chief on the porch, but this time, he's holding Sam's freshly skinned scalp. Benjamin understands the sign and proceeds to pay respect and pray for the Chief's serene afterlife before leaving the store. The first tale ends, transitioning to the first interlude. 
Billy visits the post office to pick up his package. The package is a bulb of a carnivorous Venus flytrap that he previously ordered from his favorite comic. Billy then pays for his delivery and leaves to go home so he can plant the bulb at his house. The creep then appears behind the counter to present the second tale titled The Raft, which begins with four college students, Randy, Deke, Laverne, and Rachel, on their way to Cascade Beach. Randy is a smart student who recently heard about Cascade Beach in his geography class. He invites his friends to the lake in mid-October because it's off-season and there are no crowds. When they arrive, Deke parks the car on the shore and then blasts some music off the radio. Meanwhile, Randy notices a flock of ducks struggling on the lake until they're entirely submerged under the water. So he warns his friends that something wrong is going on, but they only think he's just playing a prank. Despite the potential danger ahead, they eventually swim toward the wooden raft floating on the lake. They endure the freezing temperature as they climb aboard the raft. However, when they're finally atop the raft, they discover a huge murky blob floating on the surface. Deke thinks the blob is an oil slick, but Randy disagrees because it looks alive. So Randy and Rachel observe the blob on the edge of the raft. Rachel extends her hands to the blob, which is a big mistake. The blob secretes gelatinous sticky goo on her skin in order to pull her into the water. Everyone watches in horror as the blob devours her smelly and greasy body until nothing is left. Deke tries to stop Randy from jumping off the raft to save her because it's too late. They sooner realize they're stuck with no rescue because there's no working staff around. Just then, the blob settles under the raft, and Deke tells everyone it's the right time to escape. Unfortunately, even before making the dive, the blob squeezes through the gaps to seize his foot. It clings onto his limb to pull him harder in between the gaps until he falls under the raft. Deke dies shortly after enduring the agony. The blob searches for more bodies underneath, causing Laverne to cradle into Randy's arms. Randy helps her calm down using his muscles but not his tongue, while waiting for the blob to swim away. At night, they switch turns in monitoring the blob in case it attacks them, or watching out for incoming rescue. The following day, Randy is relieved to see Ibe survive the night. When he looks over at the blob, realizing it's far away, he grabs the chance to snog Rachel while she's still asleep. However, he becomes too complacent and invested, causing him to neglect the blob. Laverne suddenly screams in a chicken voice as the blob devours the half side of her sexy face, and the only thing Randy can do is watch. Randy swims off to the shore. However, the blob swims after Randy right after it finishes its meal. Randy uses his strength to escape until he reaches the shore. He catches his breath while shouting to insult the blob. However, his cockiness provokes the blob to rise up and swallow him off the ground. The blob retreats back to the lake, where no students are left except the booming car dumped with clothes. However, unbeknownst to the group is a warning sign of no swimming, but barely noticeable among the shrubbery near their parked car. The second tale ends, transitioning to another interlude. Billy's trip to his home is interrupted by a band of bullies. The bullies round up around him, and the bully leader snatches the bolt from Billy to stamp it on the ground. Billy then winds up his stinky foot and kicks the leader's groin so he can escape on his Tesla bike. The leader drops to his knees due to pain and orders his goons to pursue Billy. Meanwhile, the creep emerges behind a tree and continues his final tale named The Hitchhiker, which begins with Annie, a beautiful wife of her lawyer husband, who's rich in cash but poor in hormones. However, despite the riches her husband offers, Annie cheats on his poor hormones with a gigolo lover. One night, Annie wakes up beside her secret lover, but she hurries into her clothes after learning it's late. She needs to get home before her husband, otherwise he's going to suspect her of having a hormone affair. She has seven minutes to race home, so she accelerates her car to get home fast. During the trip, she smokes a cigarette while formulating a perfect excuse, in case her husband comes home first. She then reaches an interstate in Maine, where the road is curved and slippery. Just then, Annie rattles her cigarette while driving, causing an ember to drop on her leather gloves. Annie freaks out over the cinder stain on her gloves, rendering her to lose her grip on the wheels. The car swerves off-road, but when Annie tries to regain control of the car, she hits a hitchhiker with a signed Dover. Annie stares at the body for a moment, contemplating whether to save him or not. However, when a strong light emerges nearby, Annie impulsively flees at once to escape punishment. Right after she leaves, two strangers, a trucker, and even Annie's husband himself, pull over near the crime scene to check on the hitchhiker. The husband takes the initiative to call the police and report the accident as a hit-and-run. Meanwhile, Annie composes herself, convincing herself that there's nothing to worry about over a simple accident. However, as time passes, guilt gradually consumes her to the point where she begins seeing hallucinations of the hitchhiker. Just then, the hitchhiker appears to flex his bloody and deformed figure and limps toward her car. 
Annie tries to evade him, but he only teleports on the roof and enters through the sunroof to get a hold of her. But he gives his thanks repeatedly every time he pops out. Annie goes off-road to enter the woods and uses the tree branch to knock him off the roof. Annie drives back on the road, but he manages to crawl his way to the front seat, causing Annie to wet herself. She showers him with multiple gunshots, luckily not her water. After the humiliation, she then kicks him off the seat. Afterward, she runs the wheels all over the hitchhiker until blood gushes out of his head, splattering all over the road. She then speeds up the car, trying to boost her morale when the hitchhiker shows up on the hood with a new placard, but this time it reads, you killed me. Annie hysterically screams in fear and in a chicken voice, causing her to swerve off-road and skid down the hill. She continues to the woods and repeatedly rams the psycho hitchhiker to a tree trunk until she faints. Minutes later, the snow falls down and Annie eventually regains consciousness. She clears the windshield and discovers the hitchhiker is gone. She thinks everything must be a nightmare, so she goes home with ease. On her way home, she thinks the smashed up car is the perfect evidence for an excuse to tell her husband that she got into an accident. When she finally arrives home, she sees her husband's car is still not parked there and therefore means he's late. She's relieved for a moment, but suddenly, the hitchhiker pops beneath the car like a pangolin, jumps near her face to flex his skin-exposed face, and strangles her around her chick neck, possibly to prevent her from making any chicken screams. The garage automatically shuts down, trapping car fumes from Annie's idling car. Annie's husband eventually comes home, but he's surprised to see smoke escaping the garage. When he enters inside, he discovers Annie, with a Dover sign on her hairy chest, has suffocated and died from carbon monoxide poisoning due to the gas fumes. It's revealed that the hitchhiker isn't real, and she wouldn't really die if she never wrecked her car to begin with, because her exposed car has emitted too many fumes, to the point of it filling up the garage with smoke. The movie ends with the last transition to the prologue. The creep is ready to leave, and is on his way to a new town to tell his creepy stories. However, his departure is interrupted by Billy, who's still escaping from his bullies. The creep believes Billy can resolve his issue, so he waits for him to defeat his bullies. Billy enters a private property with a scheme on his mind. Afterward, he stops by a circle of an empty plot, surrounded by the bullies. The bullies are confident to think they've trapped Billy, but Billy smirks at them. Just then, giant Venus flytraps sprout from the ground and eat up all the bullies, including their smelly parts. It appears Billy has previously bought a bowl of Venus flytraps before and only rebought one to plant another new pet. Meanwhile, the creep returns at the back of the truck, throwing the comics in the air as the truck departs to another town to give a good tale to tell. This Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.